we were looking at the incremental model of the uh, clock and data recovery circuit with forwarded clock. So, that means that we just have a delay line whose delay we are just based on uh, phase detection. The model was this is the phase of the input data. and this is the phase of the input clock and this is the phase controlled by the loop. The phase detector gain is I C P by 2 pi if it is linear and you have uh, 1 over S c which is the impedance of the loop filter. Okay. This is the incremental control voltage and this is the recovered phase okay. phi c k oh sorry this is phi c k in and that is phi c k the recovered phase and any charge pump noise can be added here after dividing by the gain I C P by 2 pi. So, it has the same transfer function uh, as from phi n. Any jitter in the input clock can be added there and any jitter in the delay line can also be added there. Okay. phase noise or jitter in the input clock as well as the delay line they both get added to the same place. Okay. Now, this is a simple first order loop with a loop gain equal to I C P by 2 pi omega naught k tau by S C. Okay. So, <laughs> the unity loop gain frequency is that constant okay this is also the closed loop bandwidth okay <coughs> the transfer functions are uh, very simple What is phi C k by phi n? It is a low pass transfer function, uh, first order low pass transfer function with a pole at omega u loop, right. And then uh, what is phi C k by phi c k in which is the same as phi c k by phi j. Actually, I mean this phi j is the jitter in the delay line right, because obviously phi c k in is the phase noise of the input clock. This is the phase as well as the phase noise of the input clock. Okay. What is this? Yeah, it's a it's again a high pass transfer function. Uh, qualitatively, it's the same, right? Meaning, uh, there also from the <coughs> VCO to the output, it was high pass. Here, from the delay line jitter to the output, it is high pass. That means basically that the loop will track any low speed variations, but the high speed variations will be left untracked. Okay. And by the way, this is also the same as uh, phi C k by I C P. Okay. So, the same transfer function with can be used with the scaling factor 2 pi by I C P uh, to find the effect of the charge from noise transfer function from I C P. So, you can find everything 
Now, one uh, what is the qualitative difference between the case with the without the forward clock when we had the VCO on this one? It was second order, and what was the constraint because of that? Yeah, this will always be stable. Uh, <coughs> well, yeah. Where is this picture? Yeah. So basically, I mean, stability is uh, a lot easier with this, right? First of all, you don't have the zero, so you don't have that constraint, and then I did everything with the linear phase detector. With the bang bang phase detector, the phase detector gain is uncertain. It is dependent on the input jitter, right, or the jitter between the input data and the clock, the jitter that the phase detector sees. But it doesn't matter. It only changes the phase detector gain. As long as it is first order, it will still be stable. Okay. Whereas in the other case, you could have problems. And I think one of the assignment questions asks you to see what happens if the VCO control node has a parasitic capacitance, right? Here also, the delay lines control node will have parasitic capacitance, but that will simply add to this. Okay. So, any C p here will just add to the integrating cap and if you want you can make some corrections and so on. So, this is a lot easier in terms of uh, stability. The loop gain magnitude looks like this. And the transfer function, the jitter transfer looks like that, okay. And uh, the transfer function from either the input clock or the delay line jitter looks like that, it is a high pass with the same corner. Right. I'm not going to draw the phase. Of course, a first order loop gain when you place it in a feedback loop, it will be unconditionally stable, but uh, if uh, any practical element brings in extra poles, right, you can still have instability because then you have higher order loop or extra delay. That can still happen, but we will not uh, model it now. Uh, for instance, let us say you have the delay line. Now, it is assumed that if you change the control voltage, the delay changes instantly, but if because of something in the delay line. Uh, there is some time lag between the actual uh, value of delay changing and the control voltage changing, then that will be like an additional pole or an extra delay and so on. So, those things can cause instability, but uh, the, those are not really a concern when you have a chain of inverters. If you change the VDD, the delay does change instantly. So, it's okay. so that is that. So, then uh, what about jitter tolerance? So, for jitter tolerance, we need phi n minus phi c k to be less than some phi naught. Okay. So, what is the value of phi n that satisfies this? That is the question.
¿Te espero mi video? No. Yeah, so this is phi n minus phi c k, right? This is correct, yeah. So, I mean, it is of the expected behavior that uh, J at all in terms of phase basically at very high frequencies it will be equal to phi naught, whatever phase difference you can tolerate, because anyway the clock and data recovery circuit is not going to respond to very high frequencies. So, if you apply very high frequency jitter, it is basically like the recovered clock is fixed, right? It is not responding to this. So, simply the input jitter has to be less than whatever jitter you can tolerate for a certain bit error rate. Now, below that it will start tracking. So, it will go up as a first order curve. That is inversely proportional to frequency or minus 20 dB per decade and so on. Normally, we do not measure jitter in dB, but you get the idea, right. So, this is omega u loop. So, as before, you can tolerate very high values of low frequency jitter, and that makes sense because you have time to track it, that is all, because from one cycle to the next, uh, the jitter is not, the phase is not changing too much, okay. The only differences are uh, uh, quantitative in that, in that case, we had a 20 dB per decade and a 40 dB per decade slope, whereas here we have only 20 dB per decade and so on. This is okay. So, here also given the jitter in the input data or the input clock, you can find out how much the uh, output jitter is. When I say uh, when you know the input jitter or uh, this one, you need to know the phase noise spectrum, right. So, then you can calculate the output phase noise spectrum and similarly, you can calculate the amount of jitter due to the charge pump noise, the delay line noise and so on. Okay. The one difference is the VCOS noise because of its cumulative nature, it will itself be 1 over f square, but a delay lines noise can be expected to be white and because of uh, flicker noise, it will have 1 over f behavior. Okay. VCOS phase noise is 1 over f square at high frequencies and 1 by f cube at low frequencies. Whereas, delay line noise is constant or white with a 1 over f component at low frequencies. Okay. This is okay. So, you can also calculate the delay lines contribution to the output and if you want just a jitter number, you have to integrate uh, the phase noise spectrum or uh, if you take the one sided phase noise spectrum L of f, then you have to multiply it by 2 and integrate it from 0 to infinity to get the output spectrum. questions about this. After this, the calculations are similar to what you would do for this assignment. Okay. So, now we have looked at uh, clock and data recovery circuits in some detail. Now, if you do let us say I have to design a clock and data recovery circuit in a real situation for either the case of forward clock or 
without forward rate clock, you should be able to do it. At least, let us say you are given a VCO, maybe we have not discussed how to design a VCO, but let us say you are given a VCO, you can design the uh, bang bang phase detector using some flip flops and put together a uh, working clock and data recovery circuit. Okay? So, now we will uh, kind of wind down the clock recovery part, we will still have a few more classes of this, but uh, then move on to phase lock loops, which we use to generate high frequency references at both sides and then uh, go to uh, equalization and channels and things like that. Okay. Any questions on any of these things? Now, one of the issues with uh, these phase detectors is that we again uh, by definition we are now looking at uh, very high frequency data, right? many gigabits per second at least. So, and this clock and data recovery circuits are running at the same frequency, right? The clock that goes through to the phase detectors are running at the frequency of the data. Okay. Now these things can consume a lot of power. They do consume a, a lot of power. So now there are uh, some uh, minor optimization. One is, of course, we had the DC realizer and then implemented the uh, phase detector in the from the DC realized data. That is possible. Okay. That is uh, again. Let's think of the bang bang uh, phase detector, which gives a digital output. We know how to make a deserializer. You deserialize all of them, A, B, and T samples. Okay. The deserializer anyway is necessary for the sake of uh, getting the low frequency data out, right? So, but of course, you need a deserializer for the data symbols, that is A and B samples, which are sampled in the middle of the uh, eye, as well as you need one for uh, the transition sample. That is an extra deserializer that you do require. So, that does consume power, but there is not much you can do about it. And then from the output digital samples, you can do the uh, clock recovery. Okay. Now, this is typically done when you implement the loop filter itself digitally. Like I said, uh, loop filter can be implemented using an accumulator or two accumulators in case of uh, uh, when you do not have forward a clock and we can use phase interpolator and so on. So, you can uh, do that. By the way, I am not going to go into the detail of this, but here also it is very easy to see that we can. implement the loop digitally. So, let us say you have a delay line with a variable delay setting okay, all the way from uh, 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 1 period in some increments. If you have that much, you can certainly uh, cover everything right? that is possible. So, then uh, what do you need to implement the, uh, let us say you use a bang bang phase detector, so that you get digital outputs up and down, either one of them is 1. Okay. So, what exactly do you need to implement the loop, complete loop digitally? Yeah, in this case, all you need is one accumulator, right? Because what we are doing is we are integrating up minus down. Instead of that, we should accumulate up minus down, and based on the accumulator data, perhaps quantized version of it, you have to select the delay. That's all. Okay. So then, when uh, this is near the center of the eye, what happens is alternately you will get up and down. So the accumulator will keep on toggling between some two settings. So that uh, bang bang will always be there in any digital kind of loop, right? Dig digital loop does not settle to some exact value simply because of its quantization. So, but uh, you have to choose the steps in the delay to be small enough so that this is acceptable. Okay. Now, uh, so that is when you implement digitally, you deserialize and then do the whole thing digitally. Of course, that causes a delay in the loop that we saw, right? So that also has to be modeled. That appears even when you have this uh, case of. Uh, forward rate clock, right. If you use a bang bang detector and a DC realizer, you will have delay. Although ideally, the way I drew it, it looked like a first order loop. When you have delay and a first order integration, that thing can be unstable, that you understand, right. Because the phase shift can go to, uh, I mean, the larger the delay, the more the phase shift, right. So, that thing can become unstable or if you look at it in the Nyquist plot, you can have encirclement of uh, minus 1. Okay. So, that can be unstable, there are those things have to be taken into account. Now, what we will look at is, uh, you may want to implement the loop in an analog way, but still you do not want to use uh, flip flops, which are clocked at the full rate. That is, for 10 gigabits per second data, you do not want actually to distribute 10 gigabits per second clock. Okay. There are multiple problems with this. right? Uh, simply distributing a higher frequency data takes more power than distributing a low, sorry, distributing a higher frequency clock takes uh, more power than distributing a lower frequency clock, because everything the drivers and all these things will consume 
more power ok. So, that is why sometimes there is interest to implement these things at half rate. In fact, a uh, lot of the common implementations even at 10 gigabits per second tend to be at half rate ok. So, essentially what we are trying to do is to implement exactly the same thing as before let us say either the linear or the bank bank phase detector, but uh, the clock should not be earlier the clock was at full rate ok. Now, the clock is at half rate it will have multiple phases and so on ok. So, the advantage of this is your distribution network can consume less power and then give you some uh, more advantage in terms of some settling time and things like that ok. So, this means that so, let us say your data is like this. Originally, we had a clock which was supposed to be like that. Now, we do not have this, we just have a clock at half the rate. Okay. Now, for this binary or Alexander phase detection, we need three samples right A, T and B. Now, if we have a half rate clock like this, we will get only A and B right. To get the transition sample, we need one more clock phase, which is essentially if you refer it to the half rate, it will be 90 degrees out of phase ok. I will say 90 degrees because if this is 0 degrees, this has a 90 degrees phase lag compared to that. Phase lag meaning, I mean, of course, this is phase at half the rate. Okay. So, you will need two clock waveforms. So, these circuits will look more complicated, but in spite of that, you could end up saving power because especially what happens is if you look at the power dissipation of these flip flops and so on, uh, over some range of frequencies, it goes up linearly with frequency. Okay, if you double the frequency, you end up consuming twice the power, but as you go to higher and higher frequencies, it goes super linear that is it goes faster than a linear and especially this uh, <coughs> happens as you go towards the when you approach the capabilities of the process. Okay. This is the power dissipation and you can take any example circuit let us say flip flop or a frequency divider which is also made using flip flops and so on. So, over some range of frequencies it will be like that, it will be linear, but it would not go on doing that. So, what happens is it will do that and at some point it will start doing this and it just goes up very steeply ok and this is sort of the technological limit. So, some uh, beyond some f 1 you may not be able to realize things at all ok. Now, what happens is the way you make uh, circuits faster and faster is by pushing more and more current into a given parasitic capacitance ok. So, that means that typically you end up making transistors bigger, so that it uh, pushes more current and so on. Now, as you go to as you make this bigger and bigger and faster and faster. So, let us say first you imagine a scenario you have transistors and that is driving parasitics which are outside the transistor and those are fixed because of wires and so on. So, then if you increase the current driven by the transistor it will get faster right, it is easy to see. Now, what happens is that as you well know the transistors have their own parasitics. So, as you keep on doing this the transistors parasitics start dominating ok. Then if you go on increasing the size of the transistor to increase the drive current the load which is also similar also increases. So, the speed does not increase at all ok. Now, exactly at what speed you stop that depends on the process it will be I mean you can make faster circuits in 65 than in 130 you can make faster circuits in 40 than in 65 and so on. Okay, that is the technology, but in every technology you see this type of behavior. Okay. So, clearly if you are operating here operating at half the rate may not make much sense, because it will anyway take uh, because typically when you operate at half rate what you have to do is you have to also parallelize. Okay. You then need to have two parts of the circuit identical parts working at half the rate. So, it will not buy you much benefit, but here if you are here 
versus if you are there it is a huge benefit okay. Because even if you make two copies of that circuit you will still be consuming lesser power than that okay. So, that is why we have this of course, you need to have 0 and 90 degrees so that you can get uh, uh, 3 samples A T and B which are separated by half cycle at the original data rate. Okay. Now, one other thing I want to point out is that although we have half rate clocks, this is not the same as uh, the whole circuit running at half the frequency okay. and the whole circuit is running at half the frequency this data interval will be twice as wide and so on. Okay. Now, although the clock waveform is twice as long twice as wide the data is constant only for the same period. Okay. So, some timing constraints remain exactly the same. So, this half rate business here in this context it is not the same as running everything at half the frequency okay. because the timing window you have for the data is the same because if the data is at 10 gigabits per second you have 100 picoseconds in each uh, bit interval and beyond 100 picoseconds you can have transitions right. It is only some small fraction of 100 picoseconds you have to sample the data. So, that remains the same whether you have half rate or full rate. Okay. But, because the clock is wider you have more time for everything to settle and so on. So, how would you go about doing this with the half rate clocks? So, with the full rate clock, so for a particular phase detection let us say this is A 1, T 1, B 1 this set of samples gives you the information about this particular edge right the edge over here. And then next you have B 1 becomes A 2 that is the A sample for the next time T 2 B 2 these three samples give you the uh, information for this particular edge and so on. Okay. So, now you need to involve multiple clocks here. So, A 1 will have to come from 0 degrees clock okay, and B 1 will come from the 180 degrees clock basically this thing inverted right. If I if we assume sampling at the rising edges it comes from there and then T 1 comes from this and T 2 comes from there and so on. Okay. Is this clear? So, I have a neat figure. So, I will copy this over. So, here what I have is Earlier, we remember we had two paths, right? One is uh, sampled on the rising edge of the clock, the other one on the falling edge of the clock, and finally, everything is retimed. Now, we have four paths because we have clock 0, which is this, and then I will not draw clock 180. Clock 180 is basically clock 0 bar. Okay. Similarly, we have clock 90, which is this one. And then we have clock uh, 270, which is the inverted version of clock 90. Basically, you need four phase clocks. Earlier, we had two phase clocks that is 0 and 180. Now, we have 0, 90, 180, and 270. Okay. Now, what were the logic uh, operations for up and down? What was up and what was down in terms of A, T, and B? B X R T is up. Is that correct? A X R T is up, I think, right? Uh, yeah. 
If A x or t is 1, that means that the clock is 2, because if A is different from uh, t, what does it mean? Uh, this uh, this thing has to slide to the right, right. If this is slid to the right, then A is different from t. If it is slid to the left, B is different from t. Anyway, I also have to every time work it out. I can't remember these things. But. So, up and down are like this. Now, like I said, this is clock 0. On the rising edge of clock 0, we get A 1, right. This is some A 1 for some uh, detection. Then, <coughs> assuming that this clock 90 is assumed to lag clock 0, right. Clock 90 lags clock 0 by 90 degrees. All these things you have to be very careful while reading papers or working your stuff out, because there is no absolute convention for these things. Clock 90 in some cases could be leading this, some cases could be lagging it and so on. So, every time you just have to draw it and figure it out. Once you know the logic, it is not difficult. So, clearly A T 1 B 1, they form one set of samples from which you can get the phase information of the, that edge. So, A 1 appears here and on the rising edge of clock 90, this T 1 appears, right. And then again I have assumed timing only on the rising edges, you can also have falling edges and uh, clock 0 and so on. On the falling edge of clock 0, which is the same as the rising edge of clock 180, this sample B 1 appears, is that ok. Earlier what was happening is you had A and then you uh, had another flip flop after that. So, basically that would just delay it and then give you A and B. Now, you have to have two parallel paths for A and B. Okay. And then these two are retimed with clock 180, so that A T 1 B 1 are time aligned. Okay. this B 1 is anyway on clock 180. So, now these three signals A 1 after this flip flop, T 1 after this flip flop and B 1 are aligned in time, they are all synchronized to clock 180. Okay. So, these three signals basically that is A, that is T and that is B, all three are time aligned on clock 180 degrees. Okay. Is this okay? So then, of course, I have uh, this A X or T to be up, up one, and then B X or T to be down one. Is this okay? So this up one and down one basically give you information about this particular edge. And exactly the same thing for the next one, where I have A two T two B two. A two is on the falling edge of clock 0, which is the same as rising edge of clock 180. Okay. So, this is B 1 is A 2 always, right? it is the A sample for the next edge. And then uh, this transition sample happens at the falling edge of clock 90 or rising edge of clock 270. Okay. So, that is over here and this B 2 will be on the rising edge of clock 0. So, basically this is B 2 but the next time around okay, at the next rising edge of uh, clock 0. Okay. So, now again I uh, will retime all of these things to this B 2 is on the rising edge of clock 0 that is the last one. So, I will retime A 2 and B 2 A 2 and T 2 also with clock 0. So, these two flip flops are used to retime A 2 and T 2 on clock 0. So, basically these three uh, things here A 2, T 2 and B 2 which is over there, okay, which is basically this all three are synchronized to clock 0. So, then again I take A X or T to be I think have I made a mistake here, yeah this uh, it should have been X or B T not A X or B. 
okay so this is a mistake is the mistake here also here it looks okay for up one and down one it is okay for up two uh, let me fix this for up two this is a a x or t this is fine and then Should I mean connected that? Okay, this is fine. So this one, I suggest that you just draw the uh, waveforms with half rate clocks, 0, 90, 180, and 270, and then figure out for yourselves. Because you need now two parallel paths, because each one is giving only alternate information on the alternate edges. So you need up one and down one for uh, these edges, and up to and down to for these edges okay this is fine so now this is a circuit where all the clocks are at half rate the input data of course is at full rate and you can implement this uh, when you reach the when you approach the edge of technology's capabilities uh, you can uh, typically implement this with a lower power than the other one this one actually has more latches than the other one right i have written everything as flip flops but as oh sorry the second stage is the latch so you have now 1 2 3 4 times 2 8 latches and 4 latches here whereas the other one how many did it have 5 i think right 4 no i think 5 latches right one of the stages had two flip flops the other one had a flip flop and a latch so that is how many 4 plus 3 7 latches is it? yeah so this is 12 latches at half the rate versus 7 latches at full rate so this can be advantageous of course this has like 4 xor gates that has only 2 right and you can simply for charge pump you can just have the two switches operating from either it's up one or up two the up switch should be on right similarly down one or down two the down switch should be on Any questions here? I mean, there isn't much theory here. This is an implementation thing, so that's why I suggest that you go and draw the waveforms and make sure that everything works as advertised. And okay, let's say you want to be like even more cheapo when it comes to power. So you can say that hey, I will use only alternate edges. Okay, that is possible. I will use only let's say up one and down one and I will junk this all together. So, I can remove some of the components. Okay. The reason to do that is now of course, when you are throwing away half the transitions you are losing information. So, that means that your bandwidth will be smaller and so on your jitter tolerance will be lower etcetera etcetera. But the thing is I mean if you are absolutely constrained for power dissipation you can always say that I will not do phase detection at every edge, but every alternate edge. Okay. That is possible and that is the stuff that shown on this side where I have grayed out some blocks. If you remove that, you have a smaller number of flip flops and gates, but uh, uh, you will only get information on alternate edges. Okay. I will send you the slides, so you do not have to copy this down uh, with the fix. Now, there is also a half rate version of the linear phase detector. Okay. Now, this one is a little bit uh, more misleading than the other one. Again, I will not go through this, you can verify that. Here, the clock is of course, at half the rate, but it is a linear phase detector. So, the up and down waveforms are exactly the same as in the original case. That is, for half cycle, they will be high, up minus down will be high for half a cycle and then uh, plus 1 for half a cycle and minus 1 for half a cycle when the whole thing is fully aligned. So, the up and down pulses are still quite small. Okay. Whereas, in the other case the up and down pulses are also twice as wide, they are as wide as the clock that you are using. Okay. So, this one 
it's okay it is a some i mean again the advantage is that the clock distribution is at half the rate but it's not the same as everything running at half the rate right i'll send you these two slides you can uh, work out those things and if you have any questions we can discuss them okay any questions about any of this stuff okay so then let's stop here for today